Yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me, please? I'm so used to saying that just because yeah. it's in the uh, My name is Edward Niger. I am the co managing partner of the law firm ASKLT. Uh, and my practice uh, is at the intersection of mass torts and bankruptcy. So we're going to be talking about mass torts and not class actions. Mass torts is kind of a class actions, distant cousin. And how many people here, just so I know uh, in the audience, how many people here are familiar with mass torts? Okay. So I'll get into the main difference between mass torts and class actions, and then I'll go into a little bit of my background and tell you how I get into it. I'll be speaking really slowly because I actually thought that I'm going to be doing the closing remarks, which is 10 minutes. And I got here early because I figured I'll have time to you know, write down my thoughts and have time what to say. But uh, at around 4.30, I got a text. Where are you? And luckily, I was just two blocks away. So. I'm going to wing, a little, wing it a little. Um, now it's a small group, so feel free to ask questions and you know what you think to throughout the time. I do think I have a really interesting case to talk about, and that's the new form of bankruptcy. Uh, so we'll get into that. First, the difference between um, mass courts and class actions. Class action is you have one class rep, you, you uh, initiate a lawsuit, and that class rep represents all similarly situated claimants. And the idea is that it's similar damage. Damage is the same. In mass courts, whether it's a product recall or wildfire or sexual abuse case or opioids, everyone suffered different kinds of damages. So you can't just take one class rep and follow it. You have to represent each and every individual. Uh, so that's the difference between mass courts and class action. How did I get into mass torts? So I was a bankruptcy attorney, uh, started off at Wall Guys, so worked out on the tail end of Enron and WorldCom. And I always knew I wanted to have my own law firm and uh, run my own practice and frankly run my own life. Uh, but I needed a good opportunity to jump ship and leave the big firm life. How many people here are, are big firm partners? How many are former? I'm sorry. No, I'm You like it? No, I left happily. Oh, okay. But I enjoyed a lot of Yeah, well, I learned a lot. I wouldn't say I enjoyed working. So the opportunity to start my own firm came in 2008 in the form of a global economic meltdown that I remember distinctly. They called us into a conference room and they said, Firm's going to be a new client, but this client is so confidential that you know, don't talk about it around the world. Don't you know, the cafeteria, just you know, don't talk about it. It's a new bankers. Okay. Who's this new bankers? Lehman Brothers. And I said, Sayonara, I'm out of here. And I gave my notice, my two weeks' notice that day. Two, two weeks to the day, I was up and running a small office downtown. I didn't even have. Uh, Office furniture. I did have an assistant. I got an assistant. She was in one corner of the office. I was in another corner of the office. She was, you know, ordering uh, legal pads, pens, highlighters, printers, and I was just going through all my contacts and just letting them know about my new venture, starting a bankruptcy firm. And I was so busy that first year that by the end of the year, I had six full-time employers working with me. Uh, representing everyone from people who had filed personal bankruptcy because of medical debt to Swiss banks and Lehman with multi billion dollar claims, talking about swaps and derivatives. It was just, I don't know if you remember 2008. Happened. Some of you seem like you we'll remember 2008, some of you seem like you we'll won't remember 2008. 2008 was one of a kind time. Um, it was a good time to be. We have to admit that we were never doing this. <laughs> I had a derivative case against Lehman. It against Lehman? 
Wow. over these issues and then they collapse and that was the end of the case. So there you go. So I got calls from Swiss banks with all these different claims, swaps, derivatives. Since it's recorded, I'm not going to admit I really don't even understand how they work. Like, what are they going to be doing? Uh, it's just a matter of finding the claims and matching. Did you have to like match all the numbers? Uh, we had to, it was so much, so much uh, numbers matching. And then, and then, you know, the interesting part there was, well, why do people put money in Swiss banks? And the answer is because they don't want anyone to know about their money. Well, now in order to get money out of lien, you have to file a claim. Claim is public, and it's not the bank that files the claims. They're not the creditor. The creditor is the actual account holder. So you have to do a whole work around like, you know, another number matching system where you didn't have to put your actual name in. It was, it was interesting times. Um, I stopped doing individual credit work, and somehow individual debt work, somehow I just ended up being the creditor's rights lawyers. I would represent trade and all the big bankruptcies, uh, manufacturers, distributors, uh, a lot of overseas clients. And that turned into, I started getting calls from people who represented the mass courts clients when the defendant filed for bankruptcy. And the first one was uh, the Boy Scouts. Not the Boys Bankruptcy, the Harvey Weinstein Bankruptcy. But we got a call from some of the lawyers representing some of the victims saying give me a representation. Uh, the next one was PG&E, uh, the PG&E Bankruptcy, where you know, thousands of people lost their homes and all their possessions from these massive wildfires that PG&E caused. And I got involved with that, and there I was on the official courts committee. And you had people, you had lawyers on the courts committee representing thousands and thousands of people. And they were going to make millions and millions of dollars in fees. And it was an interesting time for me because I would fly in to California, uh, Delta, extra, extra living, that was my treat to myself. And these people were flying in on their private jets and yachts, and I'd be sitting in the room with them. And they would speak. Now, they were smart with lawyers, but. It wasn't something I thought they're, they're extra special, especially talented at. I thought I could do it. So I said, when the next bankruptcy comes around, I'm going to try to represent the creditors. And the next bankruptcy was the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy. Now, in Purdue Pharma, how many people are familiar with Purdue Pharma? Anyone involved? No. Purdue Pharma, I'll give you a little bit of background on Purdue. It's owned by a family called the Sackler family. And they invented a pill called Oxycontin. What is Oxycontin? It's an opioid, uh, the, the active ingredient is oxycodone, which is opioid derivative. Contin means continued, so it's continued its use. You don't really keep on taking it. It lasts for a very long time. And the claim that they made was that it's not a dividend. In addition to doing that, uh, opioids, oxycodone, and oxycontin were primarily used for um, end of life, palliative care, people in extreme excruciating or debilitating pain, people going through chemotherapy, for example. But the opioid industry was very successful in turning pain into the fifth vital sign. So there's the heart, there's the breathing, I don't know what the other two are, but the fifth one was pain. And not only did they do that, but they said because Oxycontin and its progeny are not addictive, it should be prescribed to anyone in any kind of pain. I don't know if they said it's prescribed to a head, but you go in for surgery, you have your tooth pulled. Oxycontin will cover it. Now, insurance love this because instead of paying for rehab, and by rehab I don't mean rehab from addiction, but instead of paying for physical therapy, things like that, to help you rejigger your body so that you can operate in a way where you don't have pain, you just give it a pill. So insurance companies pushed it, the pharma industry pushed it. Everybody loved oxygen. I remember that I once uh, 
that the, the release by backseat after I broke my knee. This was, I was 16. This must have been in the early to mid 90s. And this is right when Axie came out. Axie came out in the 90s. And I tried it and I loved it. It was amazing. I really, not only the kick with the pain, it just made, made everything better. It really did. And I remember tapering off at the end of my supply because I just wanted, I wanted to make it last longer. I wasn't tapering to try to get off it if I thought I could get more. I didn't know where to get, you know, licit or illicit opioids. But I just remember how good it felt. And I totally understand anyone who got addicted and was able to get more, whether from a doctor or on the streets, I totally understand um, why they do it. You have to be almost crazy not to. Um, the problem was, that a lot of people on my league did know how to get more. And a lot of the doctors were incentivized to keep on writing, keep on writing, keep on writing. They had all these different perks. They had a speaker program, just like uh, you have a speaker program, if you write a lot of oxy, then you go to the Bahamas or a speaker, and then you get speaker fees. It was a whole racket, and everyone was in on it. Opioids, the, the doctors, the salespeople, Politicians were in on it because uh, as as people started realizing there's problems with oxy, people wanted to do things legislatively against them because uh, the opioid industry literally owned the politicians. Uh, those bills never passed. So everyone was in on it. What happened was people were getting sicker and sicker. Has anyone watched uh, Dope Sick or Red Dope Sick? Yeah. Empire of Pain. America was addicted to oxy. That's just a fact. And when the supply ran out, it was so overprescribed that you could just get oxy from a friend. And years later, which is what we're dealing with now, when our politicians woke up to the problem, you can't just stop oxy. You just can't. So they just go to heroin. And Again, I don't blame I don't blame them for doing it. And when heroin gets laced with fentanyl, that's when the people die. So that's a story of Purdue Pharma in a nutshell, obviously. It's much more complicated than that. Much longer. Now, in around 2007, there were some lawsuits against Purdue. They settled. The states got the right to monitor Purdue. Uh, they didn't, for whatever reason, I have my theories. Uh, and then the, the opioid crisis just got worse and worse and worse. Until around 2017, where some of the state's attorneys general decided we're going to sue Purdue, we're going to sue all the opioid manufacturers, we're going to sue the distributors. And those lawsuits are going by now. Every day we'll be in a mass settlement with CBS or Cassidy. But the only plaintiffs in those cases were states and municipalities. There were no individual plaintiffs. I wouldn't say there were no, there were very few individual plaintiffs, and those who did sue didn't really do very well. And the reason they didn't do very well is because of what I explained. They usually never died of oxy. They usually died of either, they may have died of oxy, but they got it on the street, because after a while, even the doctors started so getting the supplies. So it produced like, well, not my fault if you got it on the street. Or they went to heroin, they died of heroin, laced with fentanyl, and it was like, well, you shouldn't have done heroin. So that's why the individual wasn't really going to do well. The states started suing. The states have a lot more power. They have consumer protection power. They can bring different causes of action. And besides, they're the state. They're, they're the state. So when they sue, they're not suing on behalf of one individual. They're suing on behalf of their state for hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So why did I decide to represent individual victims in the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy? The answer is bankruptcy is an interesting creature, especially in the case of Purdue, where Purdue said, okay, we're filing for bankruptcy, just, just take us, you know, do what you want with us, we're done. They were willing to give over the company uh, 
uh, as a public benefit corporation, whatever that is. But in bankruptcy, there's something called equitable subordination, which means you could equitably subordinate someone else's legitimate claim for various reasons. One of the reasons is bad acts. So now the victims have an opportunity because they, if Purdue is giving itself over, whether your claims were strong or weak against Purdue is irrelevant. It just had to be stronger than your competing claims. And what I've learned is that the states were completely complicit in causing the opioid crisis. Why? Because as I mentioned, in 2007, it was a settlement with the states. And that settlement gave the states a lot of oversight powers, a lot of enforcement powers. And they didn't use it. And then also, as I mentioned, the states knew when and where people were dying of overdoses. They knew that in this cluster of neighborhood, there's 10 times more overdoses than somewhere else. The states have the power to see which doctors ran bills and prescribed thousands and thousands of prescriptions to few people. And they didn't do anything about it. And now they're coming along and saying, oh, big bad Purdue, give us all your money. But what about the state's role in the opioid crisis? That was an opportunity for victims. Because victims were not involved in allowing Purdue. Victims went to the doctor, they broke the knee, they had, they had a tooth they had extracted, extracted. And the doctor gave moxie, that's all they know. So, but like I said, you can't do class action because every victim has a different story. Every victim has different damages, right? Some victims lost their job. Some victims lost their families. Some victims went to jail. Some victims lost their life. You can't do that in class action. So I had to get clients to represent and never do proper bankruptcy. Well, how do you get clients? And I always wonder how do class action lawyers get clients? How do you get you know, the lead plaintiff? Well, you know, if you want to tell me, tell me. I'm telling you my trade secrets. Um, there are or, there is a, or, one organization in particular, but there are lots of organizations that I had an image that this organization catered to people who lost loved ones to overdose. And someone loses someone to overdose. I don't want to say what's worse. I mean, it's always terrible to lose someone, but there's a shame associated with it. There's a stigma associated with it. Sometimes there's a surprise associated with it. You know, the mother never knew that the child is using drugs. So this organization caters to families that are suffering from this particular kind of trauma. And they also give them money. Usually if, if one person in the family suffers from addiction, they're not the only one. The family needs to appeal to the other people if we have to the other people. If uh, the breadwinner in the family dies, well now the non-breadwinner needs to support the remaining children. And in the worst cases, they just provide money for a funeral. It's an unex unexpected expense, thousands of dollars. The kid who dies usually doesn't have insurance to pay for that. Well, how is a family that's living paycheck to paycheck going to pay thousands of dollars for a funeral? You can't just let the body hang out in the funeral parlor or in the morgue for months on end until you get the money. So this organization provides money for the family. And they invited me to a lot of their events all over the United States. And after the event, they had a room where uh, vendors can speak to these individuals. You had one vendor who provided free Narcan. Narcan is a drug that if someone's dying of overdose, just inject them with the Narcan, and it's a life saving drug. And why they don't have Narcan everywhere is beyond me. You know, I think it should be in every place with a defibrillator, it should be Narcan, because you walk by the street, especially in New York, you don't, you don't know uh, who's suffering from addiction and who's about to overdose. That's besides the point. I've learned a lot in this, in this journey. Um, 
But I would, I would be invited to anyone who wants to speak with me after the event, the end of the room, and I would just speak to them. You were lines to speak with me, lines just to know. Really, they just wanted to talk to someone, um, and it was a really eye-opening, traumatic, um, heartbreaking experience for me to hear. Mostly mothers, usually mothers, sometimes they're siblings. Uh, tell me their stories. Um, one thing the mother told me, which I'll never forget, was the best time of her day, she was her son to open the best time of her day is for a millisecond right when she wakes up. Because for that split second, she thinks, oh, it's just a dream. And then reality sets in. Uh, the other thing someone told me, this is a father told me, his son, his son, his son died of overdose. He didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in an afterlife. He said, Ed, I just can't wait till I die. And usually when parents say that, and I hear that a lot, I can't wait till I die and I'm back with my child. And we're together. But he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in afterlife. So why would he not wait till he died? He explained, because a lot of people, when they die, their life flashes before their eyes. And he can't wait for his life to flash before his eyes and I'll be with his son again for while that happens. <laughs> so these are the people that I represented. Not all stories were this bad. Not everyone died. Some people, like I said, lost jobs, lost lives, lost wives, lost children, lost custody. And some of them are really inspired. Some of them got their life back. Uh, there's one, one of my clients who was a very high level, not a high level, a mid level person in the Clinton White House. Got addicted because he had um, uh, Achilles heel in surgery. Got addicted. He ended up on the streets of Florida shooting heroin, homeless. And by luck, by the grace of God, whatever you want to call it, he got into rehab. Rehabs, for the most part, don't work or don't work on the first try. They'll work if a person is really committed to it and has the money for that. Um, but it worked for him, and now he's an uh, advocate for uh, people suffering from addiction, their families, trying to get resources to people because the state and government, they are literally the first in helping people get resources. When someone wants to go to rehab, when someone has that moment of clarity that says, I want to get better, how long do you think that lasts before they want to get another hit? maybe a day. But if you want to go to a state-run facility, it's weeks to get a bed. You know, that moment passed. So many people are on the waiting list, and what I've learned was the facility will call the mom and say, okay, you have a bed ready for your son, and the mom says, my son died two weeks ago. A couple of other crazy things that the states just don't get. For example, some facilities say you can only come in if you're hot. So a person is sober for a week, worked really hard, went into detox, now he wants to go into a halfway house type program that has services. You can't come in because you're not hot. How ridiculous is that? Others are just the opposite. You can only come in if you're clean and sober. Well, if I were clean and sober, I wouldn't need your facility. I need your facility because I have a problem. Really nuts. Um, a couple of my clients were in halfway houses. And one of the things you need, one of the biggest impediments to getting better is you just need money to live. You need food, you need transportation. And governments provide these to people who are in need. But they don't provide it to people in halfway houses. And why is that? It's not a policy issue. It's they think it's fraud because when you have a whole bunch of applications from the same address, and they go, they just check it off as fraud. So people in halfway houses can't get the services they need. Well, guess what? If you don't have money to eat, you can't get a job because you have a criminal record. 
What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So these are the stories I dealt with. Let's go back to the Purdue bankruptcy. So the Purdue bankruptcy, it turned out, morphed into a case of victims versus states. And for all the reasons I just mentioned, we thought we had the strongest claims. And therefore, we should, we should come first in line. But let's go over to the two states and the federal government and the DOJ and everyone else that has their hands stretched out. We thought we had the strongest claims for other reasons. Number one, everyone who I represented could produce a prescription to Oxycontin. The state's theory was they didn't have a prescription to Oxycontin, they had no nexus to Purdue. But their theory was because Purdue caused the opioid crisis, all the damage that the states incurred because of the crisis, you know, garbage, crime, medical, is produced fault. But there's just one problem. Oxycontin on a pill, like pill basis, consists of only 3% of all the opioids on the market. So what causation do you have? You have this theory that Purdue caused the opioid crisis. It's a nice theory, maybe it's true. But there's no direct causal link. We have a direct causal link. The other argument we had was without the victims, without the actual individual victims, there is no opioid crisis. So how could you cut in line before the victims? What the state said, and not all of them, some of them were good, but some of them were really horrendous, said, they come before us because each and every one of my clients voluntarily ingested opioids. They didn't voluntarily ingest opioids. Some of them went so far as to say, why should they get any money? They're just going to spend it on more drugs. There's a lot, obviously, I can't talk about because of confidentiality, but the victims and the states weren't the only people. There were the NAS babies, who are also victims, but uh, different, different category. There were insurance companies. There were uh, rates, uh, what's it called? It's a class action thing, rate, rate payer. In other words, rates went up, rate payers. There were the Indian tribes. There were about 20 different categories of plaintiffs, each saying, we deserve produce money. Judge Drain, who is the bankruptcy judge in White Plains, who is one of the finest jurists I know, and I'm really sad that he's been retired. I guess it's because of the stress of the Purdue case, but he's been retired in Geneva. Realized what a difficult case is going to be. And he ordered everyone to mediation. The mediators were Judge Lane Phillips and Ken Feinberg. Ken Feinberg is well known for being the 9 11 mediator. The, the BP oil spill mediator, and he wrote a book called What Is Life Worth? And it was made into a movie played by Michael Keaton. Ironically, the book Dope Sick, which is all about the opioid crisis in the Appalachian region, uh, became a TV series also played by Michael Keaton. But that is neither here nor there. So they were tasked with mediating two things. Number one, the amount of money going to come from the Sacklers into the estates. And number two, how the, all the different creditor groups within the estate will split up the money. It's a Herculean task. Nobody thought it would be possible, but uh, I didn't really deal with Judge Wayne Phillips that much. I'm sure he's an amazing dealer, but Ken Feinberg is really does, does wonders. Now, they were each making uh, half a million dollars a month on the case that I thought to myself. First I thought, oh, I said become a mass force I said we become a mediator. But he was really, he was really talented. Uh, and it was, by now, the pandemic started. So I stopped going to all the groups, which my wife appreciated because I, you know, I have two small, I had, at the time I had one small daughter at home. Uh, and my wife was pregnant. And, you know, I'm all over the country meeting these groups and you know, explaining to mothers that if they don't assert their rights, it's gonna be forever waived. That's all I'm going to the bankruptcy. You know, it doesn't matter what the statute of limitations is, if you don't file a claim by the bar date, you can never file a claim again. 
But the pandemic put a stop to all that, so my wife appreciated that. Um, ultimately, with about 10 or 15 other law firms, we gathered a group of 60,000 victims in Purdue, which is the, the largest amount of victims, I believe, in a bankruptcy, but I'm not 100% sure, but it's definitely up there. Uh, so the, the, um, the mediation was all done by Zoom, and you know, I would be pinning the different people. There were a lot of interesting characters in this case. For example, you had Joe Rice. Anyone heard of Joe Rice? Rice Molly. Joe Rice is probably the richest lawyer in America. Um, worth multiple billions of dollars, and I had an interesting story with him. Uh, so he did a lot of the mediations from his yacht. It was just interesting to see. Uh, Ken Feinberg, as rich as he is, was in his basement with like drop ceiling and you know, furniture from the 1960s, like a really modest life. Um, my story with Joe Rice is, I just want to make sure that I can actually get into the details. When does this session end? 540. 540? Uh, who's at 540? That's what I want to know. You, really don't, you, really you are free to wrap up early if you will. Okay. So I'll save my Joe Rice story. I'll talk about the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy because it is the most fascinating bankruptcy in American history. And I'm including that at Lehman Brothers, General Motors, and Emma. We went through months and months and months of mediation. And you know they, they made their arguments against me. I made my arguments against them. The states were represented by four different mega law firms. I realizing uh, when I'm in above, you know, I don't know what the expression is. When I'm in over my head, that's the expression. I hired the law firm of Biden Case, by the name of Chris Shore and Tom Gloria. Tom Gloria used to have a business card that says, I, I'm not going to say this is recorded. So <laughs> it, his business card said, I walk into a room, I F it up, and I walk out. That was his motorcycle run. He's a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. And he, he actually did the Hertz bankruptcy most recently. And he had a younger partner by the name of Chris Shore. Now, I've seen Chris operate. He's probably one of the finest bankruptcy litigators I know. Because I've been, as I said, I've been representing predators in cases. And I tell my clients, okay, you're going to get a 60-cent recovery. I do the math. And I figure out how much my client's going to get. This is the center of recovery. This is the assets. This is the secure debt. This is administrative debt. You know, bonds are over a billion dollars. Trades are over you know, hundred million dollars. And you know, I figure it out. And then Chris Shaw comes in to the case, representing some bondholders. And next thing you know, he's like, he's getting all the money, and he's owning the company. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Well, you know, how did that happen? So I knew he was a good person to hire. We hired him. Mediation was really, really strenuous. Uh, but ultimately, we settled on, uh, I think the Sacklers would put in $4.5 billion, $750 million of which will go to the victims. The rest will go to the states, to the insurance companies, to the um, municipalities. And the mediators, amazingly, um, were able to work out all the in, in truck creditor splits. This is where the case gets interesting from a legal perspective. The Sacklers say what you want about them are not idiots. And they say, we'll give you four and a half billion dollars. But we want what's called a non consensual third party release, which means no one can ever sue us for a opioid related claim, ever. Not victims, not states, not municipalities. New York City's not part of a lawsuit. Law then New York City could file a lawsuit then and go after more money for Sacklers. So they said, we're giving you almost half our wealth, but we want a non-consensual third party release, which is the hottest topic now in bankruptcy. And it's going to go before the Supreme Court. What is a non-consensual third party release? Anyone know? It basically says, go for it. Oh, it's a global release. You global release. You have an injunction from a federal court 
that says you can never be sued by anybody for any reason related to this. Right. You don't get that in class action. Nope. And you don't even get that in mass courts. You get it on a temporary basis in a class action, which is interesting. And it'll be an interesting point in the argument to the Supreme Court. You get it on a temporary basis in a class action until the final settlement. But I thought people can opt out of the class. So. They can opt out, but no one can sue during this interim period while the settlement is being evaluated. Okay. But afterwards, they can. Afterwards, yes. I assume the statute. If the statute oh. has no way, right? Yeah. So that's what the Sacklers wanted. And I agree to it. Insurance companies agree to it. 25 state attorneys general agreed to it, but 25 didn't. Roughly one party wins. I don't know why. It's not, it's not a partisan issue, but that's just how it came out. Um, the judge ordered the 25 back to mediation. The 25 who did not agree to it uh, were led by Tish James from New York and Maury Elia, Massachusetts. And then they went to mediation, not in front of Ken Feinberg, but before another bankruptcy judge. Uh, by the name of Shelley Chapman, an amazing person, and a kind person, and an understanding person, and a compassionate person. And I'm not saying that because she's a bankruptcy judge, because she's also retiring. Um, and she was able to extract from the Sacklers not more money, but a document depository. And that document depository will have Purdue and the Sacklers put in 30 million confidential, privileged documents between them and their attorneys and everything they've done for the last 20 years so that scholars can analyze it and think about it and the truth will ultimately come out. That's what Morgan really wanted. She wanted the truth to come out. But there were still nine attorneys general left over who did not agree. Now, in bankruptcy, there's also called something cram down. Does anyone know what cram down is? Go for it. Uh, the ability to involuntarily bind a minority of creditors to the will of the supermajority. Right? That's exactly what it is. So now you have nine state attorneys general being cramped down by, um, you have to do the math. There were only 48 in it to begin with, so 48 minus nine, that's 37, right? 48, yeah. No. What is it? It's 48 minus not 39, right? Whatever it is. Um, I'm a lawyer, and I started off as an accounting major, and I took accounting one, it was fine. I took accounting two, and you know, account, you know, the, we had our final exam, and it has to equal each other. That is how the credits have to equal each other. And I was like, two minutes before the end, I added them up, it didn't equal each other, and I didn't know where I made the mistake. And I said, forget it, I'm not, I'm not going to be an accounting major. So math was never nice, nice phone. But now we had, so now Judge Drain, in a seven hour bench ruling, no bathroom breaks, confirmed the plan of reorganization. And he said that the point of it was, it's not perfect, the Sacklers should give more money, uh, but you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This plan, a key component of the plan was all the money that the states get has to be used towards abating the opioid crisis. So yes, nine attorneys general are not happy, but their states will still be getting money to abate the opioid crisis. Now with people dying every day at such staggering rates, uh, he confirmed the plan. He based it on a long line of Second Circuit precedent that allowed uh, non-consensual third-party releases, which is why Purdue filed bankruptcy in the Second Circuit to begin with. The Second Circuit allows non consensual third party releases. Uh, they derive that power from, uh, from Section 105 of the Bankruptcy Code that says the court may enter any order uh, to enforce the provisions of this code as appropriate. And the question is, what does as appropriate mean? Well, clearly, the judge can't give Sacklers releases from jail. And the Sacklers did not get criminal releases, they just got civil releases. Uh, so the question is whether non-consensual third-party releases fall within that. The argument that they don't fall within that is as follows. 
if you get a non-consensual third party release, it generally doesn't have all these all the restrictions that a debtor who gets a discharge gets. So it's like going to the library and the library says, members may borrow books for two weeks. And you walk up to the library and say, well, I'm not a member, so I can keep it for longer. The people who are getting the discharge, in this case, the sacklers, they're not, they're not, uh, they didn't file for bankruptcy themselves. And yet they're getting a release that may even be broader than a debtor would get in bankruptcy. So that, that's a two sides of the coin. But we were sure, and frankly, the nine losing attorneys general uh, figured that was the law, but they appealed anyway. I later found out that they did not want to, they didn't even think of winning the appeal. Nobody thought they would win the appeal. It was appealed to the district court. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They can rail against the Sacklers, the Sacklers are terrible. They shouldn't get released. They should go to jail. I mean, not that the bankruptcy plan released them from jail, but you know, they can rail against the Sacklers. It's very politically uh, rewarding to do that. They're going to lose the appeal. They'll get the money for abatement. And you know they can say, I didn't cut a deal with the Sacklers. Well, guess what? They won at the district court. The district court reversed three decades of Second Circuit precedent, including binding precedent. Um, including her own precedent, it was it was it was surreal. Uh, the main lawyer for the debtor would point out to the judge at the district court, in this and this case, you yourself have uh, affirmed third party releases. Well, I changed my mind. They have a right to change their mind. Um, but. To her credit, she said, it's about time to get a definitive ruling from the Second Circuit on third party releases. I advise, in this case, everyone who was going to appeal, the losing side is going to appeal. I advise the parties to ask for permission for an expedited appeal, which the Second Circuit granted. Second Circuit, uh, this was in January. Second Circuit grant, granted expedited appeal. And oral argument was last Friday. So you're getting, you're going to get hot off the press. Um, I should say something else. From the time the district court overturned the attorneys general who were still against the plan back into the meetings before Judge Chapman, and miraculous, miraculous, I mean, my clients gave the attorneys general a whole presentation. They they settled. And the 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 one point of the settlement is that the sacrifice are putting in another billion and a half dollars, which is more than half their wealth, and also more than uh, than the profits they made from Oxycontin. I should also say that a big part of the bankruptcy court's ruling and why he affirmed the, the bankruptcy plan and the settlement was it's really hard to get money from the Sacklers because a lot of their wealth is overseas and trusts. So you have to also weigh how, how long it will take to get that money. And if people are dying every day, you really don't have time, if you can ever get them. But the other amazing thing and I give the nine attorneys general, even though I was very angry at them for fighting this plan that I worked so hard on, uh, the thing that they got was for the first time ever in a non-criminal proceeding, victims will have the right to confront this Sackler. And it happened, it was a full day thing. Yeah, Kathy Sackler, I think Richard Sackler was on the phone, David Sackler, who, who is now running things for the family of the it was also in the of COVID. And victims confronted the Sacklers to tell them, what did you do to my family? And that was probably one of the most heartbreaking days of my life. And we had one victim who played the 911 call when she discovered her son blue dead. She played that in open court for thousands of people to hear, including the Sacklers. Uh, so that's what makes this Purdue Farm, that's why I say the Purdue Farm bankruptcy case is so, um, unique and the um, one of a kind. I don't think there will ever be another one like it. Thousands and thousands, over 130,000 uh, victims filed claims, 600,000 creditors in total, trillions and trillions of dollars in damages. These are numbers that far surpass the Puerto Rico bankruptcy, far surpass the Roman bankruptcy. It broke so many records, and now it broke the final main record where. In a civil case, for the first time ever, there would be a truth and reconciliation commission where victims will get to confront this effort. And that happened. And the nine dropped their objection. So now it's only the Department of Justice fighting the plan at the Second Circuit 
against 48 attorneys general, 130,000 victims, insurance companies, thousands and thousands of municipalities, the third, the Department of Justice is fighting uh, the bankruptcy crime, which is the most mind-boggling thing ever. Why are they fighting it? Because they're against the concept of third-party releases. But didn't Joe Biden and his State of the Union say that fighting the opioid epidemic is one of his main priorities? He didn't say that fighting third-party releases is one of his main priorities. And now you have $6 billion ready to go to states to abate the opioid crisis, to give people Narcan, to give people rehab, to, give, to educate people about drugs. And the Department of Justice is the only obstacle. I'm sorry if uh, I'm getting... Argument, uh... The argument was that it's unconstitutional and that the bankruptcy code doesn't... No, 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 how did the panel... Okay, your that's, what, that's, that's what I'm here to report. So, three panels. One judge, Definitely for the plan and for the releases. I thought that like after Friday, I'll at least have some closure. I'll, even if it's bad news, at least I'll know. You know, sometimes you just want to end the suffering. Well, no such luck. One judge seemed, and again, oral argument is what it is. Oral argument you can't really predict, but one judge seemed in favor of the plan, and one judge seemed very against the plan, and one judge could go either way. So we're all waiting. So if I'm drinking a little more than I should at the inception, <laughs> you know why. <laughs> anyway, that's my story, and that's the story of Purdue Pharma, and that's the story of mass torts. I know that it's not class action, but I hope uh, you at least have a little taste of what mass torts is and what bankruptcy is, and a little glimpse into what's going on in the world of mass tort bankruptcy. Thank you very much.